Hi, again, this is Kathy Kennett um, with Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, and I'd like to welcome everyone to today's uh, cardiac webinar. This is the second in our series, and the title of today's webinar is Cardiac Intervention for Patients with Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy. Just a few housekeeping issues before we get started. The audience is muted, and if you have questions that you'd like to ask, please submit those in the chat box that's in the bottom left corner of your screen. I will be looking at all the questions, and we'll be trying to answer those at the end of the webinar. If we don't have an opportunity to answer all of them, those will, answers will be archived along with the video on the PPMD website. So now I'd like to introduce our speakers. I'm honored to be joined by two elite cardiologists in the field of neuromuscular cardiology, Dr. John Lynn Jeffries and Dr. Larry Markham. Dr. Larry Markham is an internal medicine and pediatric trained pediatric cardiologist currently at Vanderbilt University and Monroe Carroll Jr. Children's Hospital in Nashville. Dr. Markham has specific expertise in cardiac care and experience as an investigator for clinical research in Duchenne. His clinical care area investigations have focused around the primary goal of exploring predictors of cardiomyopathy in DMD. He has served as a member of the Center for Disease Control DMD Care Considerations Working Group, which resulted in the publication of the manuscript um, the Diagnosis and Management of Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy. He is also now serving as a member of the National Institute of Health NINDS Cardiac Working Group, which is creating common data elements for clinical research in muscular dystrophy. Dr. Lynn Jeffries is an Associate Professor of Pediatric Cardiology and Adult Cardiovascular Disease and is the Director of the Advanced Heart Failure Cardiomyopathy Center and Director of the Ventricular Assist Device Program as well as co-director of the Cardiovascular Genetics and associate director of the Heart Institute Research Corps within the Heart Institute at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Dr. Jeffries has completed his combined pediatric and adult cardiology training at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston at Texas Children's Hospital and Texas Heart Institute. He has authored numerous peer-reviewed manuscripts and book chapters on cardiomyopathy, cardiovascular genetics, and adults with congenital heart disease. His current research interests include heritable causes of vascular disease, novel drug therapies for advanced heart failure, novel gene discovery in cardiomyopathy, characterization and management of left ventricular non-compaction, and early diagnosis and management of chemotherapy-induced cardiotoxicity. He is serving on the editorial board of the Texas Heart Institute Journal and is an active member of numerous professional organizations, including the Heart Failure Society of America, the American College of Cardiology, and the American Heart Association. Welcome, gentlemen. And Dr. Markham, I'll let you start. So Dr. Jeffries and I have a, um, a large task in front of us uh, to cover a lot of ground in this uh, next 50 minutes or so. And we hope to have uh, time for questions uh, at the end. Um, so my charge during this uh, first portion is to uh, briefly go over some of the uh, implications of cardiac involvement in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So just a couple of slides on outlining the risk uh, of Duchenne muscular dystrophy and then proceeding with a discussion of different therapy approaches, uh, preventing um, or rescue therapy, and then going through a few of the medications that are used uh, for uh, heart muscle involvement, and then uh, one slide on some future directions of clinical trials uh, that are ongoing uh, with respect to this disease. So. The Duchenne cardiomyopathy, which uh, you heard a lot about in the first uh, webinar with Dr. Kripe and Dr. Hoare, outlining what we are looking at from a heart muscle perspective. And what we are talking about really boiled down is heart muscle weakness, uh, which can result in heart failure. And so if you look at this graph, um, it really outlines um, a ballpark of what we expect to see across the spectrum of young men with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, such that very few boys less than five years of age ha actually have abnormal heart function. And the number increases as boys get older, such that boys in their teens 
have anywhere from a 20 to 50 percent chance of having uh, heart muscle weakness, and then boys greater than 20 uh, have a 75 percent or more uh, chance of having a weak heart muscle. And what does that ultimately mean? Well, uh, having a weak heart muscle uh, certainly impacts survival. And so this is a study from 2002 uh, looking at older boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy who had an average age of 18 years. Um, and those boys were followed for six years from the time that it was determined they had abnormal heart function. And the boys who had a weak heart muscle did not live as long as the boys who had uh, preserved heart muscle function. And so in, a, in essence, what we are trying to do is by focusing on heart muscle involvement and heart muscle weakness is directly impact the survival of young men with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And so if we look at what happens when you have a dystrophin mutation that results in loss of dystrophin from skeletal and cardiac muscle, um, oftentimes at the initial evaluation, uh, young men will have a normal heart uh, with respect to heart muscle function. However, we know that at the molecular level, uh, which Dr. Jeffries will go through some of these pathways as it relates to heart failure, there are many things happening uh, that result in a weak heart muscle. And that happens over time. And so as boys age, there is an increasing susceptibility to having cardiomyopathy or impaired heart muscle function. And so it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when. And so there are two sort of therapy approaches. One is what I termed as a rescue therapy where uh, a young man or boy's heart muscle function is already impaired and we give medications at that point to try to turn the clock back and improve heart muscle function. The other attitude is an attitude of prevention where we know things are abnormal at a molecular level and yet we try to use a therapy before the heart is severely impaired in order to stop or lessen the process that is contributing uh, from the loss of, of dystrophin. And so there are a couple of principles to, to go through along those lines that uh, similar to vaccinations or other therapies that you give before a disease happens, on the prevention side of the screen, you would like a medicine to have a low toxicity. Uh, you would like to be able to use it for a long time. You would like the risk of that medicine to be low, the cost to be low, and there would be a significant potential for benefit. However, you would have to treat a large number of people who do not necessarily have disease in order to prevent that disease in a few people. However, if you're looking at a therapy that we would describe as a rescue therapy, which is being used for someone who already has disease, you would be willing to accept more toxicity because you know they are further along in the disease perspective. Uh, the length of therapy would depend on the response to therapy. You would also accept slightly more risk. Cost is probably less of an issue because if you have a therapy that works, most people would say, well, it doesn't matter too much how much it costs. And you would want to have a therapy that ha would have definite benefit, and you would only need to treat a small number of, of patients with disease in order to see improvement. So as we talk about some of the medicines going forward, uh, we'll mention words like prevention and rescue and and where it fits in uh, to some of those medications. And so this table was taken from the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology guidelines for cardiomyopathy or heart failure uh, management. And it really is for your educational purposes just to see um, some of the dosing uh, 
um, and all of the different medications that are available from uh, a cardiac standpoint. Some, as we'll go through, some of these medications have been studied specifically in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, some have not. Some are currently being studied. And so this is just evidence to you that there are a lot of medications used to treat heart muscle disease, and we have more and more evidence of their effect in Duchenne. And so if you look, uh, these are sort of five articles that I've shown before at the parent project meeting um, and shared with a number of you uh, who have questions for their doctors. Uh, there is treatment options which have been shown to have benefit in Duchenne uh, muscular dystrophy, um, and we will go through some of these medications. Um, there is the two Perendipril articles which are significant and show benefit from early therapy. There is Dr. Jeffrey's work which shows uh, benefit of both ACE inhibitor and beta blocker in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And then there are a couple of additional papers uh, showing that standard heart failure medications are both safe and effective, uh, specifically in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And so next we'll go through um, several medications um, in order to uh, talk just briefly about what they are and what they do. So angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or ACE inhibitors as they're commonly uh, called, come in several different flavors, um, and the names are listed here. Uh, but what these medications do is it blocks the activity of an enzyme, which decreases the production of this substance, angiotensin II, which um, the effect of those medicines is a vasodilator, which it, it relaxes the blood vessels and allows the heart not to have to work as hard, and there may be some benefit as far as muscle fibrosis. And so based on the studies to date, most everyone, um, in my opinion, um, should be on an ACE inhibitor at some point. It has been shown to be beneficial. However, the, um, the point of discussion really centers on the age at which patients begin uh, this therapy. I think most people would agree at age 10 or after, um, even if uh, the current evaluation is normal, that a discussion needs to be made about um, starting medication. Um, there is debate about starting it sooner. Um, some side effects, it's generally well tolerated. Um, however, some people can have allergic reactions, uh, cough, can be associated, it can impact your potassium and lower your blood pressure, which is good if that's what you're looking for. A similar medication um, within the same family is an angiotensin receptor blocker, uh, such as Losartan and some of the other ones. It works a little bit differently, uh, but in the same pathway in that it blocks angiotensin II from its receptor. So the ACE inhibitor stops the production and, and, and the ARB uh, blocks its binding. It also impacts another pathway. And so, um, again, it is a vasodilator and um, it also has antifibrosis uh, properties. And so its role is really for those who are intolerant of ACE inhibitors um, and it's unknown, but it may actually have an increasing role in Duchenne muscular dystrophy because there's some data to suggest it may have benefits on um, uh, muscle disease as well. Again, it's generally well tolerated. Uh, allergic reaction um, is one side effect. Um, there's less cough than an ACE inhibitor, but again, it can do some of the other similar things. Uh, beta blockers are another common medication used, um, and I've listed a couple here. Um, it, their mechanism of action is they block adrenaline uh, from its receptor. 
And so when the heart muscle is weak, which I think Dr. Jeffries uh, may have a slide showing all the bad things that your body tries to do to help your heart, some of them end up hurting your heart, and one of those is increasing the production of adrenaline. And so if you look at those previous studies that I showed, um, my practice has been to consider beta blocker therapy in all patients who have an abnormal ejection fraction if they can tolerate it because benefit has been shown. Um, what we don't know is, is there a role for this type of therapy as a preventive therapy? Um, generally, it's well tolerated, but there are more side effects than other ones, particularly with altered mood, uh, depression, uh, lower heart rate, which is good or can be good, lower blood pressure. And I have had several boys who complain of nightmares or, or trouble sleeping on beta blocker therapy. We have uh, done some recent work looking at the heart rate in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and this is why I put prevention as a question mark, where we have seen um, in the graph on the left that heart rate um, in boys without muscular dystrophy declines with age, such that a five-year-old may have an average heart rate of um, 85 to 110, uh, however, a 15-year-old's heart rate is more in the neighborhood of 60 to 80 beats per minute, and the boys with Duchenne typically have a flat heart rate, meaning it does not decline as well with age. And we have seen that those boys who maintain the highest heart rates are three times more likely to end up with heart muscle weakness uh, over the next several years. So it's unknown if it would slowing that heart rate earlier might have a beneficial impact. If you look at some other agents, aldosterone receptor antagonists or aplerinone or spironolactone, they are very weak diuretics, um, which uh, they also block aldosterone uh, from its receptor, and they are felt to have a role in fibrosis. And so their role in prevention is unclear. Uh, we'll get to some studies and investigations where this is being studied. Uh, there is a role for so-called so rescue therapy where patients who have congestive heart failure and moderate to, to severe heart muscle weakness, they have been shown uh, to have benefits in that setting. Um, they also can be associated with allergies, and they can interact with other medications and contribute to elevated uh, potassium as well. If you look at, at diuretics, so furosemide, chlorothiazide, or metolazone, they really promote loss of fluid through the urine, and they are specifically uh, designed for rescue therapy, meaning a patient has heart disease and heart muscle weakness and has too much fluid on board. And so they really help to address symptoms of fluid retention and congestion, which is associated with heart failure. Um, they have uh, side effects, particularly with many other medications, and uh, they also can have electrolyte imbalance, low potassium and also dehydration if given too much. Um, it was mentioned to discuss or briefly touch on inotropic therapy, such as milrinone or dobutamine. Uh, both of them are positive inotropes, meaning they help a weak heart muscle. Uh, one is a prostaglant um, PDE5 inhibitor. The other one is a, a direct catecholamine. Uh, these medications are really only reserved for rescue therapy for severe, severely symptomatic um, heart failure and more specifically are used for end-of-life symptom control. Uh, they must be administered in an intensive care unit setting and they have many side effects, meaning they are an intravenous infusion. Uh, they are associated with side effects of nausea, headache, even heart rhythm issues. Um, and their long-term use is associated with uh, mortality uh, from a heart standpoint. So while they may help a patient uh, 
uh, have improved symptoms in the short term, uh, long term it is not a medication that that helps other than the control of, uh, of symptoms. And so if we take all of the literature uh, that we have, and Dr. Jeffries I know is going to touch on some of these stages of heart failure and heart muscle weakness, then we can start to create a picture or an algorithm which is a compilation of the care guidelines that have been published such that a patient who is at stage A or they have been diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but based on all of their evaluation, um, people think that their heart muscle is normal. If that patient is at age 10, I think a discussion of all of these medications and the prevention versus rescue um, and deciding which uh, medication uh, and the timing of that is warranted. If a patient is in stage D, meaning it is an older boy, uh, who may have heart muscle enlargement uh, or a heart function measurement that's not quite normal or they have scarring which can be seen on MRI, then clearly that is a time to discuss uh, medical therapy and typically beginning with an ACE inhibitor or uh, ARB uh, is warranted. And if I'm starting a patient on a medication, I typically see them a little bit sooner to make sure that, that things are going well. If we advance it and go to stage C where a patient clearly has structural disease, meaning their chamber sizes are large, or they have clearly abnormal heart function, then that is, uh, again, a message to uh, turn up the therapy um, and certainly add a beta blocker therapy and make sure you have maximal dosing of your other medications, and then certainly a patient with stage D who has abnormal heart function and symptoms of concern. Um, it's the so-called kitchen sink where we try to do everything in our power to reverse uh, the cycle. Some of the medications, such as diuretics, um, may not be necessary or needed in the early stages, but really only have their role once a, a patient has symptoms. There are several studies um, and I would suggest uh, anyone who is interested can go to uh, clinicaltrials.gov and look at Duchenne and you can look at studies that are actively enrolling patients or looking for patients. Um, there's a study at Ohio State University looking at ACE inhibitor versus ARB therapy. I'm not sure uh, if that study is still ongoing or not. And then there is uh, Rivadio, which uh, is being investigated at Kennedy Krieger for boys who already have heart muscle weakness. As I understand, sildenafil is not being used at Cedar sinai but Tadalafil is being used. And this study is for patients with um, for skeletal muscle, but they are also looking at heart muscle function. And then a plerinone, um, and I, I neglected to put Cincinnati on here, um, but it is being conducted at Ohio State as well as uh, Cincinnati, and it's looking at scarring of the heart and starting an early treatment to impact that. The other studies are international studies, and I'm not sure the status of, of their enrollment, but there is a lot of interest in heart therapy in uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And I have one last slide just as, as a message that any new therapy or paper that is written generally generates a lot of excitement. And so there, uh, everyone wants to be on the latest cocktail and the latest therapy, and so everyone is clamoring for that. Uh, but then people realize, well, this isn't going to uh, fix everything. Um, and so... Um, everyone then becomes disappointed. Uh, but then we come to realize that, well, there probably is some benefit uh, to these medications. So my caution is that most drugs will not be a cure um, at this stage of the game. However, there are several drugs which will provide benefit, and we have seen benefit in particularly the heart muscle management uh, for boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Jeffries and let him uh, take over from here.
All right. And before you jump in there, I just wanted to say that um, one of the audience has mentioned that the Synergy Network is also recruiting for a clinical trial comparing lisinopril and CoQ10, and it's also on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, they have 50% participants and um, are still enrolling. So. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you, and uh, it's a unique opportunity, and I appreciate the uh, chance to talk to everyone, and uh, I'll probably revisit a few of the things that Dr. Markham referred to and, and try and spend a little bit of time talking about this idea of heart failure and what that means. Um, so this is a definition that came out a, a few years ago that um, basically talks about functional capacity of the heart, whether it can relax or squeeze appropriately. And our understanding of this has actually evolved quite a bit. And the key uh, phrase that I want you to take away from this slide is the idea that Heart failure is a clinical syndrome, and when we talk about um, the idea of, of this, it's obviously a widespread issue in our adult populations. Most commonly, it's from things like ischemia or coronary artery disease, but more and more, we're recognizing people that have genetically triggered reasons, such as dystrophinopathies, and it's historically, this disease has been thought of as that someone in heart failure comes in and they have a lot of fluid on board that they've gained 20 pounds for no obvious reason. And these are, are things that aren't always obvious, and people can be in heart failure and not have any extra fluid on board, and we'll talk about what that means in a few minutes. But when we talk about this uh, disease, it's really a complex um, interplay between multiple organ systems, the kidneys, the liver, the brain, and we'll have a, a slide that depicts that a little more appropriately in a few minutes. But when we think about heart failure, it shouldn't be thought of as just a heart muscle disease. And what I encourage people when we see them in clinic is that we do need to pay attention to things like kidney function and liver function because those are indicators of how well the heart is pumping blood. But more importantly, there are hormonal uh, exchanges or discussions between these organs that really affect the function. They also affect the heart. The kidney can affect the heart. The heart can affect the kidney, and this goes for other organ systems as well. We know the causes can be numerous. That's why people have heart failure. Um, but in any one patient, we shouldn't just think about one potential etiology. We also always have to be thoughtful. Are there any other things that might be contributing in some way? And Dr. Markham had alluded a little bit this idea of staging of heart failure, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But when we talk about cardiomyopathy, it's a difficult thing to assess. And as he was saying, you may have the substrate for a disease, but not have overt evidence of heart muscle disease. And so all of us have become very acutely aware of the need to screen aggressively in patients with Duchenne, simply because it's really not well described in any one individual when the onset of disease may occur. And we feel very strongly that um, the idea of early uh, early diagnosis, early intervention seems to make a big difference. Um, lots and lots of people have heart failure, not only in the United States, but internationally. And this benefits its, us in some ways because a lot of the therapies that Dr. Markham was talking about um, have been tried in the adult populations that have ischemic heart failure. So drugs like ARBs or drugs like potassium-sparing diuretics the, the knowledge behind the use of those drugs actually came from populations that are not Duchenne, but it gives us a lot of safety data and efficacy data that we can leverage to help young boys and young men with Duchenne, which is very helpful for us from a trial perspective. So when we talk about heart failure, as I said, the, the thing that I would have people take away is this, this really is a, a clinical syndrome. When we talk about myocardial injury, for this particular scenario, we would be talking about dystrophin uh, abnormalities. And this ultimately can lead to a change in the way that the left ventricle squeezes. And this can be predated by things like scars, you've heard. But it's much more complicated than just what an echo or an MRI shows us. We get activation of unusual and abnormal um, neurohormones in the body. This RAAS stands for renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, and SNS stands for sympathetic nervous system. The upregulation of the hormones that are involved in those cascades are deleterious or bad for people that have heart muscle disease or even at risk for heart muscle disease. They, ha they cause um, increases in blood pressure, changes in heart rate, 
all of which can accelerate myocardial dysfunction and lead to the things like SCAR that you heard a little bit about. And this cascades even further where we get changes at a cellular level in the heart muscle where that's where we start seeing things like SCAR, where we start seeing the heart become dilated. And when I talk to families about dilated cardiomyopathy, I sort of use the analogy that current in a normal heart, the left ventricle should sort of be conical, kind of like the half end of a football, that it's sort of that sort of a shape, that it has a pointed end to it, and it's pretty well circumscribed how it tapers down. When you develop dilated cardiomyopathy, we're thinking more of like a basketball, where it's more of a globular kind of a shape that doesn't squeeze very well. The purpose of a lot of the therapies that Dr. Markham alluded to are to go from that basketball shape back to the football sort of a shape in this idea of rescue therapy, as he was alluding to. But there's a lot of other changes that occur at the cellular level that we are continuing to try and understand that people have myocardial dysfunction where how do we turn genes on, where how do we turn genes off. There are some genes that are bad that lead to upregulation of programs, cell death mechanisms, and, and these sorts of things that we would like to avoid because once we lose myocardium, it's very challenging to get it back. And obviously a heart muscle that's replaced with scar doesn't squeeze very well. So all of that factored in, the target of what we're trying to approach with these drug therapies is really encompassed on the slide in that we're trying to change the way echoes look and improve ejection fractions. But at a hormonal level, these are the things that we're trying to accomplish, which we have some good therapies to try and deal with. So, and, and as I said, it, the, a lot of the things that we're trying to mitigate are things that are circulating in the blood, that are throughout the body, and that's why these drugs can sometimes be effective. There are some hormones that are beneficial in patients that have heart failure, like the natriuretic peptides, but these other ones, the sympathetic nervous system ones, these cytokines, usually are bad because they they uh, have uh, profound impacts on the on the heart muscle at a cellular level, but also on the blood pressure and the heart rate. And these are things that we don't want to happen uh, when we're dealing with someone that has um, uh, heart muscle disease. So. Primarily what we talk about in patients with Duchenne, we talk about heart muscle disease, is systolic heart failure. What that means is that the squeeze of the heart is abnormal. There are two components to myocardial function. There's the squeeze part and the relaxation part. We also have evidence that there are some uh, potential problems with relaxation that occur over time as well. And this isn't surprising when we think about if a heart muscle to get replaced with something like scar or fibrosis, the ability for that heart muscle to relax normally becomes impaired. When we talk about systolic heart failure, it's usually about the left side. And as you've heard, there's a lot of different ways that we can assess how the left side squeezes. Classically, we use echocardiography because it's relatively portable, uh, and most everyone uh, has access to echo. I think a lot of centers, including our own, have leveraged the use of MRI in a more aggressive way simply because it gives us more pristine information, and it gives us information at a cellular level what the heart muscle looks like. And so this idea of SCAR that you heard about in the Aplerinone study that we're participating in with Ohio State, we can't glean that kind of information from an echo. But we use MRI and we use a surrogate marker, this business called late gadolinium enhancement, that we can see by giving contrast. Um, evidence of that is, is abnormal. It shouldn't be there. And it's an opportunity for us to intervene, and that's why MRI is something that we've used more aggressively than in the past. And this is just a still frame picture of an echocardiogram of that basketball that I was telling you about. That This is what we're trying to avoid, um, not only with these rescue therapies, but any preventive strategies, because when we get to this level where the heart muscle is dilated and doesn't squeeze very well, um, that's really approaching this idea of end-stage heart failure and what do we do to, to, to deal with that. So you saw a slide that uh, uh, was similar to this previously with Dr. Markham's uh, presentation. But the way that we think about heart failure has changed a little bit over the past few years where we used to base a lot of what we did uh, for therapy and screening and everything was based on symptoms. And you may have heard this business called the New York Heart Association class. That's 
still evident in some of our populations, but it's really not practical for a lot of the patients that we deal with and very much not practical for patients with Duchenne. So we've really revisited the idea of how do we deal with patients, and it goes in a stage A, B, C, D. Um, as you get closer to D, more severe evidence of heart muscle involvement. So patients at stage A would be at risk of having heart muscle disease, and that would be true of anyone that carries a genetic abnormality that's associated with cardiovascular uh, problems, such as dystrophin. Stage B is when we actually are seeing evidence that the squeeze is abnormal, but patients don't necessarily feel bad with it. And you could see at that point in time, that's when we start talking about drug therapy. Um, and as you heard from Dr. Markham, the way that we approach uh, patients with Duchenne is a little different in the fact that we actually are starting to think about treating patients at stage A, where we know that uh, patients are at risk, but everything still looks okay from an echocardiographic perspective. And you heard a lot about these drug therapies, which we think are fantastic because they're pretty well tolerated and they have proven track records. And so we're excited about using those drugs, but as in all conditions, we recognize that some people aren't going to respond uh, as well as we would hope. And when you move closer towards stage C and then towards stage D, we start thinking about fancier therapies. What are the things that we can do to avoid sudden death? What are the things that we can do to mitigate symptoms? What are the things that we can do when we lose the opportunity to treat with drugs? And you heard that the oral therapies are good, the IV therapies are okay, but only for very short periods of time and when you absolutely need them. In a situation where you would be in what's called decompensated heart failure with low cardiac output, where you're not perfusing your end organs very well, we would think about things like giving epinephrine or milrinone or dibutamine or dopamine, but these drugs all carry inherent uh, toxicities to the heart muscle. It can actually do more harm than good. So we only try and use them when it's absolutely necessary. But if we can't use those and the oral therapies are failing, then we have to think, well, what could we do that would take us to the next step? So I want to talk briefly about some of the things that we've leveraged, and we use this a lot in our adult heart failure populations, about what are the other things that we can do to save lives uh, from a cardiac perspective. And I wanted to talk briefly about the idea of, uh, of advanced pacemakers, things called uh, implantable cardiac defibrillators, or ICDs. And you may have, uh, have heard about these things. You may know someone that has an ICD. And they're relatively common used in, in the general population. And I only gave you a snippet of this paper, which you could easily access. But there are a couple of, of things that stand out to us that could easily be applicable to patients with Duchenne. And so people that have evidence of ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia may benefit from something like an ICD. Um, and we in our practice are very aggressive about doing surveillance for arrhythmia and you heard previously from Dr. Markham the idea about heart rate variability and are those times to intervene. Well, we get that information from Holter monitoring but the other piece that we get from Holter are these malignant arrhythmias and these arrhythmias can be life-threatening and the, the treatment of choice for folks that have these kinds of arrhythmias is one of these ICDs and I'll show you about what one of those looks like in a few minutes. Uh, and then for people that have a depressed ejection fraction, which you heard previously, there's a very high likelihood as, uh, as uh, the age increases in the population, the opportunity for an ejection fraction to, to be depressed becomes very high. And so consideration of one of these devices may be, may be had. The other times are when if we saw someone who had a syncopal event or passed out for no apparent reason, in the face of having LV dysfunction and what's called non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, which is uh, what we're talking about today. And then people that you could even have these unusual heart rhythms in the setting of having normal function. And so we've made it a, a practice to do surveillance for unusual heart rhythms starting around age 10 is what Dr. Markham alluded to for the idea of drug therapy because we recognize that that's a time when things are probably going to be changing and we don't want to miss anything. This is a, a slide that's a little more advanced, and these are uh, newer pacemaking, pacemaking strategies that we've employed in our adult populations, and we've actually done them 
in pediatric patients as well, and it's the idea of, of pacing both sides of the heart. So we pace the left side of the heart and the right side of the heart to help restore some of the efficiency, what is called as resynchronization. And there are patients who have, who have evidence of strong benefit, so patients that have heart muscle disease where their ejection fraction is depressed, so less than 35, but also have evidence of a thing called the left bundle branch block. Um, in these populations, we can actually utilize this kind of a technology to improve heart squeeze. And so this is one of the opportunities that we always consider in patients. The majority of the patients we see that have heart muscle disease do not have this widened QRS complex that it's talking about, which is a thing that we notice on the electrocardiogram. But over time, it is likely that we will see more of this because of progression of things like fibrosis. So this is one alternative strategy that we've employed in people that have um, uh, depressed heart function. And this is just to show you where we would uh, implant things like an ICD, where the defibrillator actually goes in a vein under the clavicle with a little battery um, that's inserted under the skin. And there's a lead that actually leads from that device that goes down into the right ventricle. And through that, we can actually shock the heart back into a normal rhythm if an abnormal rhythm occurred, such as ventricular tachycardia. So obviously this is an invasive therapy, but it's one that is a truly life-saving therapy. And in the last few minutes, I'll spend some time talking about what we would consider truly advanced therapy for uh, myocardial dysfunction in the setting of Duchenne, and that's this idea of a ventricular assist device. And so um, this is something that's widely used within the adult populations, and the reason is simply is that people that have end-stage heart failure, not everyone is a transplant candidate, and even if they were, there aren't enough organs to go around to fulfill the need. So we've tried to develop alternative strategies, and one of those strategies is the idea of an artificial pump to help with heart muscle disease. And so uh, when you see in these slides this idea of where it says MCS, this means mechanical circulatory support. And I'm going to give you a very quick overview of what that entails, and one of my colleagues, Dr. Morales, will be talking uh, in the future more in depth about VAD therapy. But this is really the, the pinnacle of what we do when people are at the end stage and we don't have any other therapies and we don't want to use those chronic IV medicines that Dr. Markham referred to. And they're very important strategies because um, they are available in the United States. So this idea of mechanical pumps for the heart have been around for a long time, actually since the late 60s. But the perfection of these devices has taken a long, long time. We've traditionally used these devices as a way to take a patient who is failing and bridge them from a bad heart to a candidate for, recover, for uh, receiving a cardiac transplant. But we've developed new thoughts about how we can use these devices, and the one that I want you to think about is the one in the middle at the bottom called destination. And what that means is that we actually would plan to implant one of these devices, and it would stay in forever. Is an idea of replacing the left ventricle and improving quality of life. So um, we, we know there are, there are three sort of basic classes, and I'll go relatively quickly because there's one specific class that I want you to hear about. There's the idea of a volume displacement pump where you actually, it's a chamber that fills with blood and ejects blood, which is very similar to what the native heart looks like, where it, uh, blood gets pumped in and then it gets pumped out. The problem with these kinds of devices is that they oftentimes don't last very long. And this is the picture of one of these devices, which is one we use commonly in pediatric populations, which is a thing called a Berlin X-Core device. The blood actually comes into this device and fills with it, and then a pneumatic or an air-compressed chamber pushes a diaphragm and squeezes the blood out. But you can see with this kind of a thing that there's a lot of potential problems for wear and tear, Blood could clot inside that device, all of which would be a potential problem long term. Um, and as I said, the, there, it, there's only one way blood can flow, but the real problem is uh, long term is that it's just not a great thing simply because um, most of these devices live outside of the heart. There are some devices that live inside the heart, but they're prone to wear and tear, and they're not going to last as long as we need them to. And this is just a picture of one of those types of devices, the Berlin.
The type of device that I want you to hear about today is the idea called an axial flow pump. And this is actually a pump that can either live, the, the ones that we implant live inside the body, and I'll show you a rendering of that in just a minute, where it actually is sort of like a turbine, where there's a, a spinning mechanism inside of a tube that actually channels blood. And so it doesn't pump up and down like the previous pump, and it doesn't have a lot of wear and tear to it. So potentially this device could last a long, long time, meaning decades, and the potential for clot and all these things are much lower. And so these devices, as I said, it's a rotor that it helically spins, and we can control how fast it spins, meaning we can change how much delivery of blood to the body we need based on our needs. And there's a de device that's actually currently approved in the United States called the HeartMate 2, and we use it a lot in adult populations for this exact indication, this idea of destination, meaning that you know, um, the patient is not a candidate for a transplant, but we need to do something. This is the alternative strategy. And last year in the United States, more of these kinds of devices were put in than there were cardiac transplants. So this is becoming very uh, popular, and it's a very much a life-extending a life and a life-saving strategy. And um, this is just a picture of one of those devices uh, as I said, this is called the HeartMate 2, and the only thing that lives outside the body is that little, are those little shoulder straps with this little power pack that sits out on the waist. And on the right, you can see a picture of the device actually implanted inside of the chest where it leaves the left ventricle, the apex of the left ventricle, and goes into the aorta. And uh, the, um, the thing about this is, as I said, that they're widely popular, and we recently implanted one of these devices into a patient we had with end-stage heart failure, which I'll show you a picture of in just a few minutes. And then lastly is the idea of a centrifugal pump. And this is a device that spins blood. It uses centrifugal force to drive blood. And so it starts at the bottom, and it spins around and around, and then it gets accelerated, and it exits at the bottom. And this is sort of the next generation of devices that we use because these devices, in theory, may last 20 or 30 years. Um, and this is the most current thinking on these sorts of devices. And interestingly enough, one of these devices, which is this device called a heartware device, within the last week was FDA approved for exactly the kind of therapy we're talking about, destination therapy. And so the idea of how could we use one of these pumps long term in someone with Duchenne is very uh, important and exciting to us because, as I said, we could extend life from a cardiac perspective potentially indefinitely. Um, these are some other devices that I won't spend too much time on, but I wanted to show you this last slide, which is simply a depiction of all these devices and then the device in the middle, which is a device that we've recently implanted at our institution, is a thing called a syncardia, which is a total artificial heart. So people that have um, abnormal function on the left side and on the right side may benefit from this kind of a device where we actually have a true mechanical pump that replaces the existing heart muscle. And so this is the most uh, new technology and the most cutting edge technology, um, but one that is very exciting because of the potential not relying on recovery of, of uh, cardiac muscle function, uh, but, also, but instead uh, replacing it with something that's mechanical, that's durable. So, as I said in the last couple of minutes here, I'll tell you, we recently implanted uh, this HeartMate 2 device in a patient with Duchenne um, who had end-stage heart failure, was on home milrinone therapy, one of the drugs that Dr. Markham alluded to, and was continuing to decline. He was becoming more symptomatic. He was retaining fluid. His heart muscle function was becoming worse. And so we knew that if we didn't do something, that uh, the end was imminent for him. And so we actually placed one of these devices, and this is this young man, and he actually is currently out of the hospital with this device and is doing well and is no longer on that IV medication that I was talking about. His symptoms are gone. He's no longer swollen, and he looks great. And so this device, he's living with it at home. We see him back in the clinic every couple of weeks or so to make sure he's doing okay but his need for drugs, everything has changed dramatically. And we've potentially added a lot of years, at least from a cardiovascular perspective, to his life simply because we have a pump now that's taking over the work of this heart muscle that we know wouldn't have lasted. 
So I'll conclude by just saying, as, a, as I had uh, talked previously, that when we talk about heart failure and cardiomyopathy, this is a complex problem. It has a little bit to do with ejection fractions and shortening fractions, but it's actually a whole lot more than that, and that really gears a lot of our therapy. In our opinion, patients with DMD should be considered for advanced therapies, all these things that we just talked about. Now, I'm not saying that every person would benefit from these treatments. You have to be in a thoughtful uh, situation where people apply the technologies in the right way. But if used correctly, they can really change uh, the lives of folks that have heart muscle disease. And we are very optimistic that we're going to change the natural history of Duchenne with things like ventricular assist device therapy. So with that, I'll stop and uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you both very much. That's really interesting, and there's a lot of information here. We do have um, some questions. So um, the first one is, do either of you know if ACE inhibitors or ARBs are appropriate for the treatment of angioedema of unknown cause? Um, so that is when I mentioned allergic reaction, that is is one of the uh, allergic reactions that is associated with uh, medications of that class. So ACE inhibitors are associated with angioedema, which is swelling of, of the lips and the face uh, in response to uh, taking the medication. And so that would be an indication to not take the medication. It's not right. that common, though. Right. Absolutely. Um, Larry, could you talk a little bit about increased heart rate and whether or not when and how much is, that is a concern? When should people be concerned about that? Sure. I, I think if you um, – I, I always check that, you know, when you check into the clinic and they take your heart rate and blood pressure and all these uh, things, those are things that are recorded and, and should be reviewed um, and paid attention to. If I notice a young man who has a heart rate that is outside the normal range for what I would expect their age to be, um, I usually, as Dr. Jeffries mentioned, follow that up with a formal Holter monitor, which is a small monitor that can be worn um, for 24 hours or so, and then that allows us to count what is the average heart rate for that 24-hour period. And then if that is outside the normal range for that uh, person's age, um, then I, I um, look at everything. Um, you know, are they um, – there are many reasons your heart rate could be elevated if your blood count is low, if you actually have abnormal heart function, um, if you have heart failure, um, or are you sick from a fever or what, whatever. So we try to – eliminate all these other reasons, and then we look at what medications a person is on. Um, particularly with Duchenne, pain is a big issue, so I try to make sure that the person doesn't have bone, back, joint pain that is not being addressed appropriately. And if we can exclude all of these other secondary reasons for an elevated heart rate, um, then I think that's a time to consider altering the the, um, the medical therapy. Okay. Um, Dr. Jeffries, would you recommend that studies done by a general cardiologist be reviewed by a cardiologist with DMD expertise, or are these pretty normal studies that can be interpreted by most cardiologists? I think that's a great question. I, I think for the studies that we're talking about, most adult cardiologists would be very familiar with the idea of depressed ejection fractions and uh, fibrosis on MRI. So I think that most people would be competent at reviewing those studies. The place where we've uh, come into problems are actually carrier moms. So we we have a clinic here at, at Cincinnati Children's where we see um, carrier moms. And a lot of adult cardiologists aren't familiar that, you know, carrier mothers are at risk for developing dilated cardiomyopathy. And so it's not really the idea of, of looking at the study and giving you the right information. It's the idea of knowing that you need to do the study. And in my opinion, there are a lot of physicians out there that know a lot about cardiology, but they're just not familiar with this particular process that may not always pursue the right kind of testing. And even if they did the test, uh, 
don't recognize that it needs to be a longitudinal test, that it's not a one-stop shopping kind of thing. It actually needs to be continue to be pursued just as we would do in a young man with DMD. So in the same, along the same lines with carriers, is increased blood pressure a, a sign of earlier cardiac problems in carriers or can it be? It, it definitely could be, but I think as Dr. Markham was saying, you always want to rule out the other etiologies, and the most common etiologies would be, you know, what's called essential hypertension in the United States. So uh, a complex genetic syndrome that a lot of people have and um, something that it would definitely want to be addressed initially. The important piece about having high blood pressure is, is that if the blood pressure is not treated, it could accelerate heart muscle disease. So it would be important to, to be screened appropriately from a heart muscle perspective, but probably more importantly to get the blood pressure under control. Okay. Um, Dr. Markham, the high... A 27-year-old with a normal EF who's taking Lasartan who has a heart rate of 120, would you recommend? Yeah, I, I think um, that's certainly a, a, a patient that I would think long and hard about because as a 27-year-old, uh, the average heart rate um, would be in the 60s to 80s. And so uh, a heart rate of 120 that is consistent um, is certainly higher than normal. You would want to make sure that that truly is a normal heart rate, meaning or heart rhythm, uh, meaning it's it's not an abnormal rhythm such as an atrial tachycardia. Um, and then also a Holter monitor would be good to see the trend. Um, does the heart rate go down at night um, and only increase during the daytime? Um, but I think it does give me pause and, and would make me want to have more information um, and, and possibly uh, consider a beta blocker therapy, one, given age, two, given heart rate, um, even in the setting of a, a normal ejection fraction, but uh, I need more information. Okay. Um, Dr. Jeffries, how important are diastolic changes which often precede systolic changes? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great question. Someone who knows heart muscle function obviously asks that question. Um, they are important because as a surrogate, they may tell us that there's evidence of fibrosis. And so that's part of the, uh, you know, nidus for the study that we're doing with Dr. Raman at, at uh, OSU. This idea that those early diastolic changes um, may be evidence that there's some cellular dysfunction, meaning that there may be fibrosis. Um, the, the important thing about diastolic dysfunction is that it can contribute to symptomatology, so it may predispose you to things like pulmonary edema, which you heard about, so fluid in the lungs. Um, and it may alter your treatment strategies a little bit. So it's very important. That the problem with diastolic dysfunction is that um, it's a hard thing to measure non-invasively. So the idea of using... MRI or echo, we use fancy techniques to look for diastolic dysfunction, but it's there's still um, surrogate markers. But that being said, we're increasing the technology to be able to diagnose diastolic dysfunction. It, the chances that we've been treating patients for a long, long time that we think have pure systolic dysfunction, there's very high likelihood that they have evidence of diastolic dysfunction too if you use the right measure to look for it. The idea that the squeeze and relaxation are completely separate processes has fallen out of favor. It's sort of a continuous cycle. So if one is impaired, it's most likely at a cellular level. The other is impaired as well. So I think it's very important, and it's an idea that we're very interested in from a research perspective because it's another early marker of involvement. So it's something that we do pay close attention to. Okay. We are about out of time, and I know that there are other questions that have been asked that we haven't gotten to, and again, we will answer these questions and post the questions online with the, with the archived webinars, so all these questions will be answered. Um, they'll also be on the, the PPMD website. I want to remind everybody that on January 24th, we will have a webinar that is uh, dedicated solely to um, the issue of ventricular assist devices. Uh, there are four surgeons who are very notable in their field who are going to discuss um, appropriate use and um, selection of patients and pros and cons and
every aspect of that. So I want to um, encourage people to, to tune in for that webinar. Um, I really want to thank Dr. Markham and Dr. Jeffries. This has been hugely um, helpful, and I think everybody has learned a lot. Um, again, thank you so much, and thank you, everybody, for turning in, for tuning in. This concludes this webinar. <laughs>